All right. So here's the story. Um, back in 20, 2009 through about 2015, uh, I had actually retired from my previous job. Um, I did 30 years with Chrysler. I did four electric vehicle programs with Chrysler. One saw the light of day. Um, also worked on electric VW rabbits uh, back in the early 80s, long before a lot of people were doing this stuff. And about 2009, I had finished building an electric tractor. I had it on display and this guy came up to me and said, you might be interested in what we're doing. And he took me to the first prototype of this and I became his first employee. Now, current motor company built 54 of these guys. We bought, you know, basically a rolling chassis from China and uh, converted that to electric and um, we had an investor that was interesting at best and went out of business. But I owned this one for 10 years. The battery pack finally failed after 10 years and 11,000 miles. So last winter I said, okay, it's time. We got to do something. So this is lessons that I've learned from rebuilding this thing but also what everyone else can do, even if you don't own this particular model. So that's where we're gonna start. I took a vehicle that went 40 miles to a charge and the battery technology in 10 years changed so much that I could uh, go from a 60, 72 volt, 60 amp hour battery to a 72 volt, 150 amp hour battery in the same location. I took it from a 40 mile to a charge scooter now to 130 miles to a charge. This vehicle, I drove this from Ann Arbor over the last couple of days. I drove it 400 miles to get here. I did not wake anybody up for the entire time that I drove it and it cost me $4.32 in electricity, of which I didn't see because I bought breakfast next to the charge station, so I paid for it through my breakfast, and then lunch was the same way and dinner was the same way, so basically the cost of getting it here was invisible. So let's go on from there. Can I ask, what was the road speed average? Is this a 45, 55? It will It'll go as fast as 65, and I cruise between 45 and 50. So it, it's, it's not a slouch, and I wasn't driving at 25 miles an hour. I was driving it between you know, 45 to 55, depending on the road and how big the truck was behind me. So, whoops, ah, we'll do it this way. There you go. So there's the scooter, you've seen that. Um, the motor itself is in the hub. I love hub motors. This hub motor is now 10 years old and it's still going. A hub motor, basically it just means the motor's in the back of the wheel. I have never had to adjust a chain or a belt in 10 years. It's one less maintenance thing. The one thing you hear from people about hub motors is that doesn't it affect the performance of the bike? Because you've got some unsprung mass at the back of the vehicle. Those people have not driven a motorcycle. So if you're driving a race bike, it might matter. Day-to-day -day driving, you'd rather just not have the maintenance. And just so you know, on these motors, normally um, they're pretty trouble-free, but occasionally there's a couple of sensors that may fail. The good news is there's two sets of sensors right from the factory. So I have two sets of connectors near my controller. What this means is if one fails, you just unplug it and then plug in the other one and be on your way. That normally takes care of it. Is the replacement of the sensor uh, externally performed or do you have to disassemble the whole thing? You have to disassemble the motor to change the sensors. 
The sensors will set you back about $1.25 a piece. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's one of the bigger expenses you're going to have. It's labor. It's, well, labor is the other one. Uh, the best thing to tell you about breaking this motor apart, you can do it. You can also lose a finger if you don't know what you're doing because the magnets want to pull the side plate in with enough velocity you can take off a finger if you're not careful. There is a puller that you can use. It's very easy to build and you can disassemble it. If you do, and I'll say this very quickly, um, before you take the side plates off, take a punch and index them so you put them back in the same place. If you don't do that, the motor will wobble when you put it back together. So just keep that in mind. This photo shows the original batteries, and this is how far we've come. That's 20, oh, I'm sorry. That's 24 cells, individual cells, jammed into the frame. And of course, we were told, oh yeah, you'll never have a problem. So we didn't make it necessarily that easy to change them. That was our biggest mistake. You will have to change these occasionally, and we had to do it quite often. Hopefully that's going to go away, and I'll show you why. This is the battery pack that's three times the size of the one you just saw. You're seeing the two that are mounted in the same location, and then the third is up here. So, um, yeah, that's, ugh, what a shot. So yes, there are three packs in there. Um, the next slide, which might help a little bit, this is the information on that battery. Now, these are available right out of eBay, they're out of Amazon, usually about a thousand bucks, but that's the entire battery already assembled off the shelf. If you want to build your own battery, go right ahead. I want to ride the scooter. <laughs> I'll never get around to finishing the battery. And this comes with a battery management system and comes with the charger, all for, you know, a thousand bucks. You can do, you could probably get away a little less range and two batteries. The bind you're going to get in is this size bike will draw 120 to 150 amps of power. The BMS for this battery is only 50 amps. If you put two in parallel, you now have 100 amps of, of uh, power available to you. That's fine. With three batteries, not only do you get this incredible range, you'll never trip that battery management system. If you're drawing Okay, easy way to look at it, 100 amps of power, each battery is only going to see 33 amps of draw. The BMS doesn't trip until 50 amps. You'll never get there, you know, and you want that for reliability. The other reason to do three batteries instead of one, and one would have a single battery management system and one would have a single charger, if any of these batteries fail, I still have more range than the original bike and you're going to get home or at least to the pub. So, you know, that's something into a, you know, that'd be the way to go. So, but those are right off the shelf. I'm with you. If you guys want to build your own batteries and, you know, fit them into the existing frame, that would be super. I wanted to go ride. Now the battery chargers that came with it, my humble opinion, I'm not a big fan of battery chargers that are in plastic cases. In a plastic case, no matter what, you still have to get rid of heat. And yeah, these the battery chargers that came with it, yeah, there's vents, yeah, there's a small fan, but you know, when you feel hot plastic, that's not a good feeling. What I would rather recommend to everybody <clears throat> is buy battery chargers that have a metal case and this is going to dissipate a lot more heat and also with these battery uh, these battery chargers this particular model 
um, has two fans on it, one to suck in air and one to blow air out the other side. So I've never had an issue with these battery chargers. Also, the battery management system for these batteries is rated at 10 amps for charging. They're Chinese. I don't trust the number 10 amps. I don't want to go back into this scooter. I want to ride it. So I would ended up using five amp battery chargers just so that I'm not overheating the battery management system and possibly causing a failure. Remember, heat is your biggest enemy. So if you're not really exercising that BMS, it's gonna live a lot longer. This is where good luck engineering comes into play. So I bought five amp battery chargers. I put three of these, you know, one on each of the battery packs. Finish my wiring and I plug it in the wall. I plug it in the wall and lo and behold, the current draws 13 amps. I can charge this on any 15 amp, 110 volt plug. You know, I don't have to look around for a 20 amp plug. I'm not gonna blow circuit breakers. You know, I can charge this thing anywhere. The other thing when you're looking for battery chargers, make sure you get a battery charger that will run on 120 and 240. The reason is, if you can run battery chargers on 240, you can build the adapter to run um, to a J1772 charging station. And I'm so glad you said that because what it looks like is, as I come around here, There we go. That's the adapter you want. Carry it with you all the time and you can plug into any public charging station. Very easy to build. Just so you know, I am here all weekend. So feel free with any extra questions or if we want to break this open later on how we built this, I'm up on top of the hill with the clean transportation group. So feel free to look me up. But with this, I can either charge it on 110, I can charge it on 220, or I can charge it at a public charging station. Don't steal that. I need that to get home, by the way. <laughs> now, so you've got this problem. You've got three battery packs. Now you've got to run three wires to a common connector and then coming out the other connector is what's gonna to go to your controller. So this is, and I know a lot of guys have seen this on snow plows and such, this is a standard Anderson connector. McMaster Car is your friend. McMaster Car is an online mail order house. If you order something on Monday at five o'clock, a lot of times it's there 11 o'clock the next day. Okay, McMaster car is a little more expensive than going through somebody else, but if you need it tomorrow, that's the group I normally use. Again, my opinion, I am not sponsored by anybody. Nobody wants to sponsor me. So, um, but with these 175 amp connectors from Anderson, the neat thing is the contacts inside you can get in different sizes. All your heavy wiring on something for this is only six gauge wire. It's not that large. But with the different connectors, you can put three in on one side and one out the other. And that's, that is a fail proof system. So you're not cutting and splicing and electrical tape. You're not doing any of that. It actually all fits into one connector. And I'll show you what it looks like. So here, this is an Anderson connector. It sits inside mates together and there's three wires on one side hang on get this out a little bit there we go so i've got three wires coming in on one side one wire going out the other side 
One of the things too, be thinking with electrical. 72 volts can kill people. And I'll, I'll show you a photo later of not anybody dead. Trust, <laughs> trust me, I'm not showing you that. <clears throat> but if you look over to this side, there are three fuses. There's a fuse that comes from every battery. You'll go through those fuses before you connect everything together. These are the fuses. Again, two for five bucks. Five bucks is cheap insurance. Don't, don't fool around. Just put them in. Don't think twice. Now, this is going to be an eye chart. This isn't going to help you very much. But what this shows is um, all my light wires are labeled. I can't remember 15 minutes after I've wired something, where in the world did it go? Now, everyone has a different way to label something. Whether it's masking tape and a magic marker, that's fine, it works. But what I wanna show you with this, and I just recently found out about this and I wanna pass it on. Um, these are label makers that you can get for your standal, standard label maker device. Uh, P-Touch is the brand name that I'm using. And the label maker normally makes a label and has writing on it. They now make labels for heat shrink. So you can actually print the uh, whatever you want to write, write on the heat shrink, slip it on the wire, heat it with a match or a, a small torch to shrink it, and it's legible and it doesn't fall off. And I, I work for another company now, still doing electrics, and uh, when one of the guys told me about this, and it was an instant revolution in the shop. All of a sudden, every wire was labeled. Everybody's wire in their toolbox was labeled. I, we just absolutely fell in love with this stuff. And it's all cheap. The label maker's $33. You know, here's a two pack for 16 bucks for uh, heat shrink, and you'll be able to read it 10 years from now. So. One of the other things I always believe in, the high voltage is gonna be covered in an orange armor, and the low voltage is in black armor. So I'm on the side of the road, I'm trying to figure out what's going on if this thing dies on me. And I'm starting to stick my hand in there. I want to know what's high voltage and what's low voltage. And this stuff is cheap. Um, even the most expensive stuff, which is the black, which is split down the middle, and it's actually molded to cover itself. You can add and subtract wires as you want. And it's only a dollar a foot. You're going to need $25 worth of this stuff, you know, for a scooter or a motorcycle and it keeps everything neat and clean and orderly, and wires do not chafe on the frame. You don't want wires chafing on the frame. Let's just avoid that problem. But now I can tell easily what's high voltage, what's low voltage. Another thing I do for safety, um, it's a very, I'm using very economical um, voltmeters, that's fine. But buy extra leads, cut off the ends of the leads, and put them right to the connectors that you use, that go right to the battery. If you're hot and sweaty in the garage, and you've got a probe in this hand and a probe in this hand, and you're trying to check voltage, it goes right through your heart if you screw up. And it may be the last screw up you ever do at 72 volts. It will, it has a potential to stop you. So if you make a connector that is the female connector to the batteries for checking your voltage, you'll be safe. You'll never have a problem. This was one of the other revolutions we found. The connectors up in this corner are the ones I use for my six gauge power connections. Now I can draw 
you know, a max of 120 amps or so on this bike. These connectors don't even get warm. There is so much surface area between the male and the female connector that um, I've never had an issue. And the male connector is spring-loaded so that when you push them together, it's a tight connection. And they're small and they're cheap. Now, my middle name is Cheap. You know, that's why I'm riding a bike that only cost me four bucks to get here. But they are, um, as I say, 10 pairs for 28 bucks. Where are you going to get a $2.80 connector that can carry 120 amps of current and is sized for a six gauge wire? The ones below, um, you know, 10 pairs for 10 bucks. They're a buck a connector. And they're a solid connection, and I use those for all my low voltage stuff. And again, I don't have a lot of room under this thing. So using big Anderson connectors is just not a great way to go. And also, if you actually look at the connectors, you got more surface area here than you do an Anderson that's you know just touching in one point. So think about these. Again, all available on Amazon or any, you get to thank the electric uh, um, radio control people for these. They are the ones that originated this stuff and they're wonderful. Terry, yes? Um, just wanted to make a quick comment while you're on the topic of plugs. Yes. I've gotten in the habit of putting plugs like that on every single component. Yes. So that when you realize that you need to get back in there and yep. you need to remove, you know, yep. Ryan, Ryan, who's done this before too, he's also from the, uh, the, the gang of two-wheelers, um, is absolutely correct. Every piece that you put on, the charger, you know, your, your um, controller, everything, just put these connectors on to make it easy to change. You know, it really, it just makes it so much easier. You know, there's no reason you want to go in there with a pair of, you know, diagonal cutters trying to start cutting stuff and soldering in there. Just put connectors on. This, this is your fuel gauge. Now, back when we were first building these vehicles, we had to build our own printed circuit boards. And, you know, we were, you know, hand building dozens of resistors and a microprocessor and a bunch of other junk to get the original gauges to operate. I don't want to tell you how much money we, you know, put in doing that, but it wasn't cheap. This connect, this meter does amp hours, does watt hours, does amp reading on the fly and volt reading on the fly for 30 bucks. And there's another glory about this, especially if you're using multiple batteries. If you're using multiple batteries, the problem you've got is there's one wire that is discharge power going out to the motor, but there's three charger wires coming in. Those three charger wires go to three independent batteries. May they never cross. If you're trying to use the old shunt style meters, you can't do it. It won't work. But this is a, it's a you know, magnetic donut. Just run your wires through. And it's accurate enough for what we're doing. And for 30 bucks, you can't say no, you know, really. You know, is the... Um, is the little fuel gauge on there, is it temperature compensated? No. Go buy a more expensive one if you want that. 30 bucks works when you're just driving down the road and you can look down and go, oh, there's my reading. Yeah. So. That's the location of the, um, of the voltmeter on the vehicle. You can see that, that's no problem. And then down, down to the uh, left is just the standard charge plug, you know, which is another just 110 volt plug. Switch to LEDs. Don't, don't even think of incandescent bulbs. It's not worth it. You know, I, I think 12 bucks did all the uh, lights on this vehicle except the headlights. And then the LED headlights were like $16. They're useless, 
but you know they turn on and they light and they give you the lousiest light pattern but they're 16 bucks you know so. now if you want to put better lights in more power to you and please do the big deal is about this um, about changing the LEDs these LEDs are run by a DC power supply the DC power supply the less current you draw the cooler this thing runs and the smaller one you can use so my little DC to DC power supply is only supplies six amps the bike going down the road to run all the 12 volt equipment is two amps remember we don't have a fan we don't have heat we don't have air conditioning we just got to run some LED tail lights and turn signals and some headlights so six amps you know a six amp DC to DC converter is plenty but the other reason that I use a mean well power supply and if I get too technical just bear with me here for a minute <clears throat> the high voltage circuit has a negative wire the low voltage circuit has a negative wire don't cross those the reason is and oh I'll add this not only do you not cross them I don't use the frame for any negative wires there is a negative wire running to every 12 volt light bulb which is standard on most motorcycles the reason is if you made the chassis the negative side and the negatives were tied together at the DC to DC converter which is common for a lot of DC to DC converters and you're working on a 72 volt cable and that cable touches the frame it's 72 volts and God knows how many amps to chassis ground you're gonna smoke something you're gonna blow something up may it not be your hand and, and a lot of you know this number and I'll tell the rest of you the same thing my welder at home is 24 volts at 240 amps we're at 72 volts and 100 amps you can do some damage so just keep that in mind a little bit of thinking it's safe you know I I'm I've never had a problem I'm telling you all this so you don't have a problem oh yeah 26 bucks from Amazon right No, they're good. Yep. Oh, yeah. This particular model, the RS7512, is actually an AC inverter to DC, but it also works DC power in and DC power out. So they don't tell you that at Meanwell, but it does work. So I got 54 bikes out there to prove that it works. So so that's all fine and dandy for this guy but trying to find one of these you know on craigslist you know facebook marketplace you might, you might have some problem so but here's what you can do instead so this is now just here's some random ideas for you guys to follow this is a complete kit from amazon for a thousand bucks if you throw in $200 more, you also get the front wheel in the same diameter. Now, if you look at Amazon and you start looking at e-bike stuff, here's the secret. If you want to do a motorcycle instead of an e-bike, motorcycle wheels are measured by the rim. Bicycle tires are measured by the tire diameter. 24, 26, 27, you know, 700. That, those numbers are all um, uh, bicycles. 17 inch, 18 inch, 19 inch. Those are motorcycle wheels. Now, just so you know, bicycle tires versus motorcycle tires. Motorcycle tires are DOT approved and their standards like puncture resistance tread wear handling 
braking, you know, abrasion off the road. All those are gets you, if you can pass all that, you get a DOT emblem on your tire. And you don't get that with a bicycle tire. So I can't tell you how safe that bicycle tire is if you're deciding to go along at 55, 60 miles an hour. But if you got a DOT rating, you know, you got something that might be a little bit safer. But that's it. There's a complete kit out there for a thousand bucks. So now you start with a thousand bucks. Now you go on Craigslist and you start snooping around. What do I want to use for a frame? And a great example is this guy. This guy, this was a barn find. It was a 1952 Falcon that when he found it was missing the rear wheel, missing the engine, and the rest of it was there. And he took the time to do the restoration and now has, with that previous kit I just showed you, he has a 120 mile range and an 80 mile an hour top speed. Okay, fun bike, right? You can find this and I'll give you, let me give you this to write down. There's a wonderful website called evalbum.com. evalbum.com has um, actually categories that you can search. Motorcycles, mini bikes, bicycles. And this is this amazing wealth of information because if you're deciding to build something and you want to know how far is it going to go, someone else has already done it and it's posted on this site. So you can see what other people are using, you know, for motors, you can see what other people are using for batteries. And the site's been on long enough, almost 20 years now, um, you can actually see the earliest bikes and how far we've come with technology change. So I really recommend looking at that site um, you know, if you're really starting to think about this project. EV album. So E V A L B U M dot com. And you can find me later too if you don't get it. So now this is something that if you want to start with something kind of cool, this is an American made frame. This is made by Worksman. Worksman for years was out of Brooklyn. And now I think their manufacturing is in South Carolina. But they build this imitation of a board track racer. And you can imagine if you switch that to a rear hub motor, you know, get rid of the chain and actually fill the center with battery pack. Um, it, does, it doesn't have a rear suspension, but it does have front suspension. So it's a hard tail, you know, so be ready. It's not going to be the most perfect bike in the world, but, you know, it, it's a possibility. Now, if you don't want to build something and you just want to buy something and you're as cheap as I am, here, here's a couple of different versions. Um, Onyx motorbike up here in the top. And I was just looking these up. 72 volts, 41 amp hour battery. Yeah, you know, 30 miles, 40 miles to a charge. Um, they're all in the 5,600 to 6,000 dollar range. Um, Huck is a little bit nicer than the Onyx. Huck, and again, I am not. They don't even know I'm telling you this, so don't blame me. Um, all hub motors. And, uh, oh, the Onyx still has pedals on it. You buy it and you go talk to your Department of Motor Vehicles to see how you want to license it. Is it a bicycle? Is it a moped? Is it a motorcycle? You're going to make that choice. Or maybe the DMV is going to make that choice for you. But <clears throat> they're both 60 mile an hour bikes. You know, so are they going to go real far at 60 miles an hour? Eh, not terrific but they're capable and they're, they're a little bit bigger than uh, a moped. So, so they're worth thinking about. The Sondor's bike is bigger than the other two and it's really not bad. In, in its price range, it's pretty good. 
but you've still got a six thousand dollar bike and you're going to get you know one hour's worth of driving out of it you know at, at best so now we come along and let's take a thousand dollar kit um one thousand dollar 50 amp hour battery 200 bucks in components find your frame you know whatever the cost of the frame is from craigslist amazon your buddy you know who's 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 you know there's a garden shed out there full of bike frames um and then you know your passion and your time to build something um passion is a word i don't hear much anymore we all need to have a passion that's why we live you know this has been a wonderful winter for me with me and, and, and the scooter and putting it together and reinventing the wheel. You know, and then when you can fire it up and hop on and go ride it and ride it legally, you know, what a feeling. You know, life's too short. Just do it. Um, so there's a comparison of those. This guy, 72 volts. 150 amp hours when you look at the other guys 41 50 55 I'm three times that for less money and off, and now off the shelf components you just have to learn you know a little bit of mechanical stuff your welding your welding store is down the street they can help you build you know what little brackets you need if you can't do it yourself fine please support them they're important people and I have three times the range and probably 10 times the fun because I've done it myself. So something to think about. Um, I'm getting close to the end here, but I wanted, to, eh, I wanted to show you this. Just to show you there's hope in the world. This motorcycle was built by U of M, University of Michigan. I'm down the street from University of Michigan. They invited me to their unveiling. So they actually had, you know, the black cloak over it and pulled it off and, you know, we all had water and cookies and stuff. The bike is 140 horsepower in a 280 pound frame. I'm hoping to get a text here this weekend. It's going to its first race. Hey, Spark. Hey. It's going to its first race this weekend. And they hired, they're smart, they hired a pro rider. Because this thing is just going to be absolutely uncontrollable, you know, if, if for a beginning rider. But the idea that these components are now available to build a monster like this, um, you know, phenomenal. These kids are bright. We don't know yet. Um, it's got to finish an 18 lap race. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll find out this weekend. I'm sorry? Uh, a lap is a mile and a half. Yeah, so it's a road course. Yeah. Yeah, it is a road course. Lots of, lots of hard acceleration and hard braking. So, oh, speaking of hard braking, I'll add that. I want to add this real quick. Um, the. I am not using regen braking, and I'll tell you why. Regen braking, we learned this back with our bikes. All it really did, when you've only got a bike that's 420 pounds, you, you get a great feeling of deceleration when you hit the brakes. But with the new battery management systems, if that battery pack is fully charged, and you, you, know, you leave your garage and you go down to the stoplight and you hit the regen and the batteries are still pretty full, you will exceed the voltage of what that battery management wants to see and it will turn off. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. It will turn off. Not fun, you know, as, and it depends where you're at. If you're on one of those roads that you pull out on, you have to pull out on a four-lane freeway, and it turns off. It's a bad day. Why does the limit the It could if you spend more money. Okay? That's the thing. 
you know, if, if you can get a battery pack. And, and just to give you an example, even in the pro races, if you follow the Formula E race cars, same thing. They say there is no regen on that vehicle for like the first three or four laps. They have to have it turned off. Yeah, yeah, you get the idea. Yeah. Now, if you want to spend more money, go for it. But, but just for standard off-the-shelf components, it will, it will sting you. There's enough things in life that will sting you. you know, but, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Spend more money, you can get a regen package that won't overcharge the batteries. So, yep, exactly. Um, we're doing pretty well here. Thank you. I am thrilled to see this many people here to have this interest. If you look up at the tr clean transportation area, there's two electric motorcycles, mine and a factory zero. With the number of people here next year, can we get up to five, seven, ten more? I think we'd really have a, a great force and there's people here that can do it. And there's passion here. Any other questions? Oh, come on. I didn't answer every question. <laughs> ah, there we go. Sir. When you said uh, you, uh, you know, each battery cost you, uh, battery pack cost you $1,000. Yes, sir. Times three? Yes. Yep. So it was 3000 Yeah. So it's, I have $3,000 in batteries on this bike. Okay. So I don't have any money left in my savings account, but I have $3,000 <laughs> of investment in the, in the bike. So. And I got a brand new house, so it's not so bad. And my wife, I was out of my wife's hair for, you know, a good part of the winter. So she was all for it. So, yeah, she just raised her hand and agreed. So there you go. Yeah, she got the brand new house. So that worked out fine. Sir. Um, I know we could do the math here, but how many kilowatt hours to charge it? Yes. The battery, I can probably do this right off the top of my head. So bear with me here. It's 150 amp hours uh, times uh, 72 volts. I think it comes out to 10.8 kilowatt hours is what it comes out to. So, and that's a big battery pack in this thing. The Mitsubishi's up there are 15 kilowatt hours. I'm just, I could buy one more battery and equal the Mitsubishi's that are on the hill. So that, that's what gives you range. Battery, yeah. Range costs money. How far do you want to go? You know, is the way the song is saying. How many watt hours do you think you're doing per mile? Sh yes. Um, it was, it comes out, well, we can figure it out. It's uh, almost dead on one amp hour per mile. So take, uh, what would that be, 720 watts? Is that right? Steven, does that sound right? 72 watts, yeah. 72 watt hours per mile. So that's What's the efficiency of the charges. You pay for the you pay for the kilowatt hours going in and AC. Right? Correct. And how many you get out for? Sure. The the chargers themselves are around between 85 and 90 percent uh, efficient now, and the batteries are man they're up in like the 95 percent range. It's really amazing. You. Energy out versus energy in. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, just to give you an idea, um, yeah, right with you. Um, yeah, when you charge this, there's, there's very little, there's no heat. You can keep your hand right on top of the batteries. There's nothing, you know, it's amazing how efficient these things really are. So, yeah, you had a question. How long does it take to charge the scooter? Sure. Um, there, there's two wonderful answers to this to make it clear as mud. Um, <clears throat> the, if you absolutely run it dead, it's 10 hours. So you drive it, you know, 120 miles, you know, come home, plug it in overnight and it's fine. The charge rate is the same both on 110 and 240. So you don't double, at least with these chargers, you are not doubling the uh, charge current by going up to 240. Now, the way I got here is, you know, obviously I didn't drive 130 miles and then waited 10 hours. Normally what I do, I, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so I'm right here. I got to make it to the ferry, which is over here on the exact opposite side. So 
I've done this trip before in my little Mitsubishi, so I know that almost halfway across is Lansing, and there's a wonderful little big boy restaurant, and I love to annoy those waitresses because they know I'm just one of these old guys. And, but I can plug in right at the big boy, wait two hours, you know, have breakfast, annoy the waitresses, catch up on my email, and after two hours, it's almost right back to the 100%. Then you travel to Grand Rapids and you, and you repeat the process. I pulled into a, in this case, I pulled into a Panera, plugged in, you know, had lunch, did some emails, you know, and, and after two hours, it, it's, it ain't near full, but it ain't empty either. So then when I pulled into Muskegon, um, it, you know, on the other side of the, of the state, it was just about dead, but I'm there. You know, and then I charged overnight and then I can repeat the process. So you can, if you're traveling, you can charge as you go. If you're commuting, if you can plug it in at work, and it's only a 110 plug, you know, if your boss isn't nice enough to let you have a 110 plug, I'm, you know, you're, you're at the wrong company. But, but even at 130 miles, if you're commuting, you know, usually you can do that commute. So. so how, do you char how do you pay for it? Is there a charging station that's there's a couple ways that that works. Um, city of Ann Arbor, I love the city of Ann Arbor, and it's also nice because I don't live in it, but uh, I can visit it because it's next door. All their charging stations are free. You plug in, they do not charge you. So we're at what's called the Mayor's Energy Fair, and, um, and here comes the mayor. <clears throat> so I grabbed the mayor, and I said, Mr. Mayor, are you ever going to charge us for the electricity that we use at these charging stations? And he goes, nope, I will never charge you. And the reason is, he's making $1.85 off of you for parking in that parking spot. It's costing him 30 cents to allow us to charge for the hour. He says, I can't hire anybody to manage this and try to pull the money out of you guys. You know, so I'm never charging you. And that also goes with the big boy that I stop at at Lansing. They don't charge me for it. They just allow me to plug in and that goes for everybody. Um, you just look it up on the smartphone where all these places are. Exactly. Yeah, use PlugShare. And PlugShare is the best app you can have on your phone for an electric vehicle. It tells you all the charge stations in the area. It also tells you what they charge. Some of them are a dollar an hour, and some are like free for two hours, and then it jumps to five bucks an hour. You know, every charge station's a little different. But normally, um, I, I made it all the way here without ever having to swipe a, uh, a little card to start the charger. So, I live sir. In rural Wisconsin. So these charge stations, this big boy, it's not just some wall outlet that they use for their Christmas lights. And nope. Happy it's a real it's pedestal. A, and yes, that's right. It's a real pedestal. Um, it usually has two plugs on it. They're on big cables, and they will plug into this outlet. And that outlet is a standard North American charge plug. So every electric vehicle in North America, don't go to South America. That's another story. But um, yeah, North America all use that same connector. And the nickname of that connector is J1772. So if you hear all the jargon of J1772, that's what it is. But yeah, but you can, and I have, uh, plugged into the Christmas light outlets in Ann Arbor too. I've done that. Somewhere there's a photo of me shimmying up a pole and plugging in to the uh, outlet near the top of the lamp post for the Christmas lights. And the second photo was me in front of the pub where that uh, light pole was, calling my wife saying, I just got to sit here two hours waiting for my vehicle to charge. So, but yeah, you, you can plug in the both. But if you plug into a regular outlet, then you have to have the adapter with you. Yes. Yep. And I, and I carry one with me, fortunately. We're at the end of our time, folks. Thank you.